I don't see you somehow as part of the Hollywood scene. Would you tend to be invited to Irving Lazar's Oscar party, or that kind of thing? Or? I, I get invited to, you know, to various Hollywood parties and Oscar parties and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, a mem I'm a member of the Academy. Yeah. But uh, I guess I mean I don't see you hanging out in the social scene no, that much. And, I really uh, don't. I have a ranch in Texas, and that's really where I spend most of my time when I'm not working. Uh, you know, and plus I have a Kick Drugs Foundation in Houston. I spend a lot of time with my foundation. So uh, is most that, of my is that have a full title, Kick Drugs Out of America. America or Kick something. Drugs Out of America Foundation is, yeah. the, is the actual title, which is, means that I work with uh, inner city kids in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade levels, and we teach the martial arts as part of the physical education curriculum in these particular schools. I have 680 kids in my program, yeah. and these are see as a karate teacher for years. I taught a lot of kids, and I, s I saw what the martial arts could do for them. I had kids in my classes who couldn't communicate with kids their age or low self-esteem, over-aggressive kids, whatever the case may be. And mm -hmm. through the martial arts, we were able to help many of these kids, most of them. Yeah. But these were kids whose parents could afford to come to my school. How about the millions oh, of kids right. that couldn't yeah. afford it? Yeah. So that's what this program is, is helping work with these kids whose parents can't afford the program. How do you select them then? Because there must be an awful lot more oh, want to come in than you can handle. Oh gosh, yeah. Each that's school, you know, hard. each uh, school that we te uh, we're teaching at, of course, the average is about 800 kids. We can only handle 150 per yeah. per school, and uh, so the the teachers and the principal picks the kids, and it's all voluntary. They have to have their parents' permission. And mm -hmm. what we found out is that out of the all the kids in the school, that 90% uh, of them want to be in our program. And that's the hard part, no is picking the right, you know, the 150 out of, say, 600, 650 kids yeah. to be in the program. That's, that's the hardest part of the whole thing. What's happening, of course, is, you know, in the martial arts, you, in, you instill discipline and respect. And what is happening with these kids that we're teaching, you see that carrying over into their other classes, mm -hmm. their English, math, history classes. Now they're responding to their teachers as yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, rather than yeah, no, and all this really? stuff here. Yeah. So it's carrying over. Interesting story. About six weeks ago, I went to one of the schools, which is the toughest school in Houston, Texas. And I went there for a belt promotion. And so we awarded the kids their, their belt that mm -hmm. they tested for. And a mother had walked two miles with two infant children, an 11-month and a two-year-old child, to see her son get his gold belt. And how I even knew about this is after it was over, and it was in the evening, we were all leaving, and, he, and one of my instructors was driving down the street and saw her walking down the street with the, the two infants and the boy, and he picked them up and took them home. But what's happening is that the average turnout to a PTO meeting is 5% of the parents. What we're getting uh, is 90% of the parents showing up for That's our events. That's great. It's really wonderful that you're doing that. Well, it's, it, you know, you've got to get the parents and the kids working mm -hmm. together, and that's what's lacking in our society today is parents and kids doing things together. There is some crummy martial arts teaching too, isn't there? I mean, I know there any goon seems to feel he can put up a sign that says karate and put up a... Well, there are... busting a board. And yeah, there are the Joe Piscopos, mm -hmm. you know, who, uh, you know the, the guy that Joe <laughs> plays in this movie. Right. There are instructors like him who yeah. won't, you know, uh, go with a macho attitude and instill yeah. that in their students. Uh, that's unfortunate, but, uh, it, but that is the exception to the case, though. So, and most, you know, throughout the, our martial arts community throughout the country, yeah, those guys are, are, are exceptions to the rule. Well, without presuming to psychoanalyze you, there, there are those who do. Um, do you feel that this whole life that you have now would be all utterly different if you had had a father who had been there as a role model? Is, do, you ever, do you see any of this as compensation for that, or uh, you know, would I, you rather I'd shut up? No, I don't know, Dick. To be truthful, I, you know, it's... I've often wondered mm -hmm. if I hadn't been sent to Korea, if I hadn't studied the martial arts over there. Yeah, you were an MP. Back, mm -hmm, and, I, and I came back and started teaching, which mm -hmm. way, which direction my life would have turned, I'm not really sure. Uh, but I think we're, I, I believe in fate. I believe things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a reason because I dreamed of this as a child. My dream, interesting enough, when I was a small child, you know, we were very poor in Oklahoma, so I didn't have couldn't buy toys, so I used to use my mother's clothes, clothes pins. You know, I had the big ones and the little ones. And yeah. I used to, used to use them to do battle, to be fighting the bad guy. And always the small clothes pins were the good guys. The big ones were the bad guys. Yeah. And we, and, but the amazingly is I used to fight. I used to do kicks and all this stuff here and jump down and kick the bad guys. And, and then all of a sudden... All with clothes pins? With clothes pins. Yeah. And then as I become an adult, you know, and now I'm doing it to, with the martial arts mm -hmm. on the film and as a karate fighter and all mm -hmm. that. So it's interesting how dreaming something 
as a child doing mm -hmm. all this. And all of a sudden, that dream becomes a reality in my in my life as a martial artist. But you weren't a martial artist when you were uh, an MP in in, uh, in Korean War, right? No, I wasn't. You, you were, I, I went to Korea in 1960. Where were you an MP? Yeah, Osan Air Base in Korea. What had actually happened? I was going to be a police officer. Um, and when I went into the military out of high school, I thought, well, I'll go into police work, military police, and then, you know, get the training as in the police area yeah. and study correspondence and all that. And that was my goal, to go through four years of, of, as military police, get out and go right into the LAPD, eventually going into the FBI. That was my oh, yeah. goal. And uh, then, when I was in Korea, I thought, well, here's a great opportunity to learn a martial art. So when I become a police officer, I'll be able to handle situations on the street. Right. But again, the martial arts set me in a new direction. I became a karate martial yeah. arts teacher, and I gave up the idea of being a police officer. And then I became a karate teacher. I don't know why I had this image of the um, Chuck Norris that was nothing like the Chuck Norris we know today, being pushed around as an MP and finally secretly studying I, you karate. Know what it, I think what it was, uh, probably uh -huh. the story, uh, it was in my book, as a matter of fact, when I was an MP, before I went to Korea, uh -huh. I was stationed at this base, and I'm, I was an MP, I'm 18 years old, and uh, there was a ruckus going on at the NCO club, uh -huh. and I was sent down there to quail the ruckus, so I go in there, here's this big old sergeant, drunk, right. big guy, like 6'6", six, six. you know, I'm 5'10", I walk up to the sergeant, you know, and I had 10 hours of martial art training <laughs> in boot camp. I walk up to the sergeant, and I go, all right, Sarge, mm -hmm. you know, cool it. Next thing I remember is flying across the room, and this guy grabbed me, and I was like a missile flying across the room. And, <laughs> and I hit the wall, and I slid down the wall, and, right. and he's coming at me now. He's coming to finish off the job, and I didn't know what the devil I was going to do. I thought I was going to get the Would getting out of there maybe have been a good idea? Uh, I, what if I could have, yeah. but I couldn't get out of there. Uh -huh. And luckily, my, in, my NCO came in and, and stopped it. But mm -hmm. uh, I realized then that I wasn't prepared to deal with a, a crisis situation at that time. But then I went to Korea, and I, and I took up the training to prepare myself. If he'd killed you, there'd have been a lot of blank celluloid in the world now. I'll tell it? you, I'd have been mad at him. <laughs> I'd have been real upset if he'd have killed me.